All right, so this is uh, for bio 20, and this is the first unit, unit A, energy and matter exchange in the biosphere. Our first topic is energy transfer in the biosphere. So what is the biosphere? So the Earth has three basic structural zones. The first is a lithosphere. So lithosphere actually means land, hydrosphere, hydro, meaning water, mm -hmm. And then we have atmosphere, which is the air. So those are the three um, basic structural zones. <coughs> and then the living organisms are found in all three of these zones. These three zones make up the biosphere. So the biosphere, bio meaning life, um, it's the narrow zone around Earth that harbors life. All right, so we will find living organisms on land, water, and in air. Um, just a bit of a comparison between open system and a closed system. When we talk about an open system, that means we're allowing um, energy and matter is able to cross the system's boundary. Basically, it can enter and leave. When we're talking about a closed system, only energy is able to cross a boundary, not matter. So when we're talking about matter, <clears throat> and we're talking about Earth, Earth is a closed system. Because all the matter that's here stays here on Earth. When we talk about energy, <coughs> Earth is an open system because the sun's energy is able to enter our atmosphere and some of it gets reflected back into space and some of that gets absorbed by the atmosphere. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but um, remaining energy goes to Earth's uh, liquid and solid surfaces. Some gets reflected, some gets absorbed. But eventually, um, all of the energy is radiated back into space as heat. <clears throat> so our first topic within uh, Chapter 1 is 1.1, which is how energy enters the biosphere. So the need for energy. All organisms need energy to stay alive. Um, what does it mean to be alive? To grow, um, maintain body processes, be able to reproduce, be able to move. So when we talk about cellular respiration, that's how cells can break down glucose into carbon dioxide and water, and then they release energy. <clears throat> so there's the um, formula down here for cellular respiration. So it is uh, the sugars plus oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, and energy is released. Um, there are a small number of organisms <clears throat> that live in environments without oxygen. And the energy releasing process then is called fermentation. Um, they use fermentation, not cellular respiration. But again, those are things we'll talk a bit in a bit more detail later. So how does energy <clears throat> get stored um, in energy rich molecules? So the process is photosynthesis. Um, plants, algae, there's some bacteria that use light energy from the sun to chemically convert carbon into carbohydrates, which are our sugars and starches. So carbon dioxide plus water plus that light energy <clears throat> produces the carbohydrates, sugars or starches, and um, oxygen is released as well. All right, so it's the producers. These are those photosynthetic organisms that capture the energy from the sunlight. That energy is converted to glucose and other energy rich, rich compounds like starches, proteins, and fats. <clears throat> These compounds will then provide energy for the producers and for consumers of the producers. So any like herbivores that will eat the producers. Um, notice that photosynthesis and cellular respiration are almost the reverse of each other. If you look at the um, formula here, the equation here for photosynthesis, and then you look at it for cellular respiration, it's almost um, the opposite, almost the exact opposite. So here we have carbs and oxygen as our reactants. And in photosynthesis, carbs and the oxygen are the uh, products. Um, the reactants in photosynthesis were carbon dioxide, water, and light energy. <coughs> and here they are 
the products, carbon dioxide, water, and some sort of energy. All right, and then this uh, diagram is just showing, um, uh, here we have photosynthesis, energy from the sun, oxygen and glucose get produced, and then oxygen and glucose is then required for cellular respiration to occur. Cellular respiration is how energy um, is made available for organisms. And cellular respiration releases carbon dioxide and water. And then carbon dioxide and water is required for photosynthesis to occur. So it becomes this cycle. <coughs> Uh, just a quick definition of what a producer is. So a producer is also called an autotroph, meaning it makes its own food. And a consumer is also called a heterotroph. Um, it's an organism that has to eat producers or other consumers to survive. All right, make sure you do know those two terms, autotroph and heterotroph. Next is the albedo effect that we're going to talk about. It's basically um, a measure of the percentage of solar energy that, that gets reflected from a given surface. So very important, albedo is how much gets reflected. Um, <clears throat> so solar radiation budget helps to explain this distribution of the sun's energy. The amount of solar energy that gets absorbed by a surface depends on the albedo. Albedo means reflection. So it's um, how much of that sunlight gets reflected. The higher the albedo, the less energy that's going to be absorbed by that surface. Um, therefore, the albedo um, within an ecosystem will have an impact on the type and number of organisms that can live in that ecosystem. So for example, the albedo of ice and snow is going to be much higher than the albedo of a forest because ice and so snow will reflect more of that sunlight. <clears throat> so therefore, there's less absorbed energy in frozen environments. Um, as soil begins to be uncovered, more energy will be absorbed, which will warm the climate. Um, energy flows one way through an ecosystem. It's not recycled. Matter cycles through an ecosystem. And only producers are able to capture the sun's energy. Consumers can then use the energy captured by producers. So this diagram is like a summary of what can happen <clears throat> from the incoming radiant energy from the sun. So what we see here is that when there's 100% coming in, 51% is absorbed at the Earth's surface. 1% to 2% gets captured by producers on the land and in the ocean. 19% uh, gets absorbed by the atmosphere and clouds. 30% of it is reflected from the clouds, the dust particles in the atmosphere, from the water and land at Earth's surface. All right, and again, the term albedo is an important term. Um, it, it's used to describe the amount of reflected energy. And again, <clears throat> it's going to vary from place to place but the average is about 30%. Um, light colored areas, um, reflective surfaces, thick cloud cover, they're gonna have higher albedos of 80% to 90%. Darker surfaces like forest canopies, treetops, um, and water have lower albedos of 25% or less. Um, like we said here, 19% gets absorbed uh, by the atmosphere, so that's uh, gases like water vapor, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Some of this energy will heat up the atmosphere and some of it will radiate back into space. Um, here, the 51% um, that reaches Earth's surface, <clears throat> that energy that gets absorbed by land and oceans will warm the planet's surface. Um, some of the heat well, it will radiate upward into the atmosphere and out into space. Um, and again, it's 1 to 2% of the energy that reaches um, Earth from the sun is actually captured by the producers and converted to chemical energy through photosynthesis. 
about half of it um, is absorbed at the atmosphere or gets re re reflected back into space without ever reaching Earth's surface. <coughs> Um, so we've talked about photosynthesis, which was the use of light energy. Um, chemosynthesis is a different process that occurs in the ocean, deep in the ocean where there's no sunlight. And what happens here is, <clears throat> is there's a use of chemical compounds as energy rather than sunlight to produce organic matter. So what these organisms do is they'll split hydrogen sulfide molecules from deep sea vents. And then sulfuric acid is produced instead of oxygen as a byproduct of this process. <coughs> All right, let's take a closer look at consumers. So again, consumers are um, heterotrophs. They need to obtain their food somehow. They do not make their own food. Um, so primary consumers are the herbivores. They're the ones that are going to eat the producers. Um, so they eat the plants and they're the first primary eaters of plants and other producers. So example, um, insects, um, grazing mammals, snails, birds, <coughs> mammals that eat seeds and fruits in water. They are fish, they're small invertebrates like clams, aquatic insects. And in deep ocean vents, they are the tube worms and mussels. So those are the primary consumers. Secondary consumers, these are going to be carnivores that eat mainly the herbivores. So think of like spiders, frogs, insect eating birds. Um, and then we get to tertiary consumers. And these are the ones that are going to eat the secondary consumers. And then we have decomposers. Um, these are the group of organisms. They are still consumers. They're obtaining their energy by eating or absorbing any leftover or waste matter. Um, so for example, waste matter could include feces and dead organisms. Decomposers um, include fungi, like mushrooms, uh, bacteria, earthworms, some insects. They are very important to the biosphere because they return organic and inorganic matter back to the soil, air, and water. And then these materials will then be used by producers again. <clears throat> uh, this example here, these are larvae from a beetle, uh, mealworms. And they are eating, they eat decaying plant material. They also eat dead insects and feces. All right, let's see here. Um, a little bit more on the fate of energy in the biosphere, just a bit of a summary here. Um, so Earth, like we said before, it's a closed system to matter, with the exception of meteorites that can reach the surface, um, and satellites and space probes that we launch into space. Other than that, matter doesn't enter or leave the biosphere. So basically, Earth has the same supply of matter today that it has had for the billions of years of its history. Atoms and molecules get cycled um, in the biosphere. Um, so if we look at this diagram here, um, the yellow arrows are representing energy. The green arrows are representing matter. So if you look at the green arrows, they're just continuously kind of getting cycled. So matter cycles within the biosphere, but energy can pass through it. So basically, as chemical energy is transferred from producers to consumers to decomposers, all of that energy eventually dissipates into the environment as heat. So you can see here, heat is coming off, heat here as well, heat um, there as well. <clears throat> so the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's just converted 
from one form to another or gets transferred from one object to another. So for example, radiant energy from the sun gets converted into chemical energy um, through photosynthesis. And then that kinetic, sorry, that chemical energy can then be converted into, for example, motion, which is kinetic energy and can be um, converted into heat as well. The second law of thermodynamics states that no process of energy conversion is ever 100% efficient. Never. Because with each conversion of energy, there is always um, some energy that, that's get, that gets lost as heat, unusable heat. So with every conversion of energy, there is less um, energy available to do useful work. And again, we saw that heat coming off um, here and here in the diagram.